Susan? Sue Desmond Helm. Uh, in keeping with our serious topics like cars, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, just because we knew what Gates did at the TED before, right. which was really sneaky of him to do. Um, if for those who don't know it, Bill Gates let out a bunch of mosquitoes at TED, correct? Okay, it, all right. No live mosquitoes, no live eggs. Okay. I promise. Okay, great. Walt made me pinky swear on it earlier. <laughs> okay, all right, great. <laughs> but, what, what you, but we are gonna be talking about what yeah. you're doing at the Gates Foundation and also about some world health issues. Um, give people a little bit of your background. You, how long have you been at um, the Gates I, Foundation? I uh, joined two years ago. I'm a, a physician and a scientist, a cancer doctor by training, and moved to the Gates Foundation from University of California, San Francisco, where I was chancellor. Right. Um, before that, I was 14 years at Genentech and worked on uh, products people have heard about, like Herceptin, Avastin, Rituxan, Tarceva, uh, the novel cancer drugs in precision medicine. Okay, so you know some science. And I know some so science. You're the, I'm guessing, third head I'm, of the. I'm Gates the third Foundation. CEO. So everybody has their own program, or uh, obviously in conjunction with with the uh, Bill and Melinda and the board. Um, what are your top goals right now, and, and how has the, the Zika crisis changed, you know, made you maybe change course or, or focus differently? So, so top four things for the foundation, uh, ensure that all young people survive and thrive all over the world, empower the world's poorest, combat infectious diseases, especially those that affect the poor, and inspire others to take action to improve okay, the world. Okay, uh, maybe I, uh, uh, I, I didn't express it right. I mean, your administration. My, What's your yeah. personal goal for your, however long your tenure so there's, will be? Those are the things that the foundation um, cares about. Broadly. And I care about, I'm inspired by that. The two things that I have focused on most, one is I want the uh, Gates Foundation to be a great place to work. Uh, all the jobs I've had before, I've spent a lot of time and energy on leadership and management. Um, the not-for-profit sector is not a, a place where people talk about great management. There's not a tradition of great management in not-for-profit, and it's something I care about a lot, and we're now over 1,400 people at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, so that's a big deal for me, is that people can thrive at the foundation. And the second thing is something um, that I'm completely passionate about, which is precision public health. Uh, and precision public. precision public health. So a lot of people have heard about precision medicine. It's, uh, there's a, a US initiative on precision medicine. President Obama has committed a million dollars. There's a, a million people are gonna have their genome sequenced. It's a hundred million dollars. And yeah, President, Xi, that yeah. President Xi said, I'm gonna uh, sequence a hundred million people. So the hundred million dollar precision medicine initiative project is terrific, I'm excited about it, but it has a threat, which is that it further widens inequities in health. It makes the rich richer, more orphan diseases, more tiny uh, um, uh, approvals by FDA for drugs that cost a lot. So I've been trying to bring big data, sequencing, consumer monitoring, a lot of the same techniques that we use in precision medicine, but bring them to the poorest of the world, the people who need them the most in public and global health. Explain what that is, precision medicine, for those who don't yeah. know. So precision medicine is based on the notion of um, N equals one. If you, I bet a lot of people in the audience like math. So N equals one. So what's special about me or my disease that you, if you're my caregiver, can exploit to the disadvantage of my cancer or to the advantage of me? Mm -hmm. um, precision public health moves from right patient, right drug at the right time to right intervention for the right population in the right geography. So instead of N equals one, it's that I'm one of N. A population is affected by something. So I actually have a little okay. bit of a conversation right. starter. Okay. I'll yeah, tell you ahead. what we're All doing. Right. Okay. So you asked about Zika. Um, when I joined the foundation, literally within weeks, I, my phone started ringing off the hook. And this was it, it, literally weeks after I started. 
and the phone was ringing off the hook about Ebola. Right. And I That's thought, okay, saying, oh, once in a lifetime, this is crazy. And our foundation ended up committing $75 million and doing a ton of work in collaboration with others on Ebola. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting first year in the job. Learned a lot about uh, and talked a lot, and Bill's talked a lot about pandemic preparedness. Here we are into year two, and suddenly the phone's ringing again, and it's about Zika virus. So the thing I wanted but to show you. Before we get off Ebola, yes. we haven't solved that, though. I mean, Ebola's not solved, mm -hmm. but Ebola taught the world a couple of really profound lessons. Um, and it, it, the two lessons I think are most important in Ebola. One is that it can be unpredictable exactly what affects the world. So Ebola had been less than 2,000 cases between 1976 and 2014. Mm -hmm. Who would have put Ebola mm -hmm. on their list? Now, Ebola was on the list of potential bioterrorism threats. Mm -hmm. So we were a tiny bit ready for Ebola. There were some things often on the shelf or going slow for Ebola, but we could pull them off the shelf. In that terrorism context. In the terrorism context. So in a context. national security, you know, right. counter. In the counterterrorism in, in DARPA, in the Department of Defense in the US. Or Dietrich, places like that. Yes. yes, so there were things that had been done in therapeutics, vaccines, and diagnostics. What we were lucky with Ebola, which is why it's more contained than it has, had been a year ago, is that it wasn't flu. It wasn't transmitted through the respiratory route, mm -hmm. which would have been a much scarier, um, more terrible epidemic. And it was contained largely, with a few exceptions, within the West African countries mm -hmm. where it started. So fast forward to Zika virus. Mm -hmm. And Zika virus was, in many ways, in terms of preparedness, even worse than Ebola because Zika wasn't on anyone's list, not the bioterrorism threat list, not the pandemic preparedness list. Zika was thought to be mild. You'd hear things like flu-like, like you do when people mm -hmm. say the symptoms are flu-like. It was not known to cause serious problems at all. So in Brazil, what started to happen is obstetricians started texting each other saying, well, I'm seeing a lot more babies in my practice who have microcephaly small heads. And spreading around in Brazil was this chatter, literally chatter uh, among the uh, obstetricians. And so this became a serious question about microcephaly and a potential relationship to an outbreak of Zika virus that seemed more serious and in a region where we hadn't seen Zika before. So we know that Zika virus is transmitted by a mosquito. We, don't, we didn't know that those mosquitoes were causing Zika virus outbreaks in Brazil, in Colombia, in Puerto Rico, and we now know that. So the, the thing that I wanted to show you, I think can help you understand a little bit about how we work at the Gates Foundation. So like a lot of the entrepreneurs at your conference, we, we tell ourselves to do two things. One is to take big risks do things that might seem crazy or outlandish in the hopes that if they pay off, it'll be profoundly important. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is have some projects that are very long term. So in 2005, long before I got to the Gates Foundation, 2005, there was a bet made at the foundation. And it was a big bet. It was a big research bet mm -hmm. in the group we call Discovery, which is early R&D. And it was a grant to an Australian investigator, O'Brien, and his theory of his grant, which was an eight-year grant, it was a long grant because we didn't think this was going to be easy, he, he said to himself, the world is struggling with dengue virus. Right. Yeah. We yeah. know and knew in 2005 that dengue is a serious disease. And the same mosquito, the 80s mosquito that transmits dengue, also transmits Zika. About 60%, 60% of all insects in the world carry a bacteria. You know your microbiome that you read about? So actually, insects have a microbiome too. And 60% of insects in the world have a microbiome that has Wolbachia. The name doesn't matter, but this Wolbachia bacteria is very special. First thing we know about it is Wolbachia bacteria can make that insect infertile in some cases. 
The second thing we know about that bacteria is that bacteria can interfere with an insect's ability to transmit disease. So through a series of painstaking, excruciating experiments over a decade, these Australian investigators, and if you want to find out more about it, it's called Eliminate Dengue. Okay. Eliminate Dengue. All right, got it. Did two things. One is they made 80s mosquitoes susceptible to this Wolbachia bacteria. 80s weren't infected with this bacteria. Ah, and they, they weren't in the 60%. They, they weren't in the 60%. That's the most important thing to know. And their experiments were to try and get Wolbachia into these mosquitoes. Ah, so screw so with the mosquitoes. That, to, absolutely. Okay, yeah, we you. don't usually. Yes, I'm a science <laughs> genius. <laughs> so the idea is if you could infect the mosquitoes with this bacteria, they couldn't transmit ah. dengue. And turns out they couldn't transmit Zika and they couldn't transmit chikungunya. So you did this, it, what? Chikungunya virus. You're freaking me out, Susan. These are okay. all scary ones. <laughs> so this is the good part. No mosquitoes in here. No mosquitoes. And but I, now. I have a, no, here's what I brought. Okay. If you speak Australian, do you know what a mozzie is? It's a mosquito. So one for each of us. Here's your mozzie box. This is a Great. citizen science project. So we each get one as if, so school children in Australia get a mozzie box. And they bring the mozzie box home. Okay. And the mozzie box has, you, you can see. This one's for you, Neelai. <laughs> yeah. The red strip, if, if I wasn't on stage yeah. and wasn't pre-warned not to bring any mosquitoes, this is impregnated with 50 female 80s mosquito eggs. These what? are just dots drawn with oh, a, well, a looks, marker. Looks Don't like worry. Looks like more than 50. There's, okay. there's 50 mosquito female eggs on this. So you okay. put this in there. Right. Yeah. Then there's some mosquito food. These little pellets are mosquito food. So you open this. You can do that with me. All right. No, nothing scary in here. Just drop them in the box. So there's mosquito food and, and female mosquito eggs. Mm -hmm. What then is you, mosquito food? What is Like anything, right? It's like any food. Right. It's got a little sugar, yeah. little calories in okay, there for so the Okay, so they eggs. like that. Then you try pour a about a half a cup of water in there. I'm gonna try some. You can do that, half a cup of water. Can I try some mosquito that? food or something? Like, please don't eat that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They don't follow directions. Right. And then you put okay. this in your backyard in a okay. shady spot. Open. Open. And two weeks later. Could you put Chinese food in here instead? <laughs> <laughs> two weeks later, 50 female 80s mosquitoes will be born. You fly close out it. of your you backyard, oh. right out of this. Oh. They will fly out of your Why backyard. Why will they be that kind of mosquito in particular? The eggs have Wolbachia in the eggs. Oh. So those female mosquitoes will meet with, mate no, with the male. No, but why will they be the 80s mosquitoes? That's so what's in the red, the red thing that's in oh, your I box. See. So they're sending so, out a plant. So they, so you are actually growing 50 female mosquitoes in your backyard. That normally you would not want to have that kind of. You mosquito. would not normally want to do that. But, but these in, will be. In this case, these mosquitoes cannot transmit Zika. They cannot transmit dengue, and they'll mate with males, and all of their offspring will be infected with Wolbachia and unable to transmit Zika. So you're using sexually transmitted diseases to solve. That's exactly right. OK. That's the citizen science. Wow, I wonder if Tinder can help. And so um, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> the um, really good news with wow. this is it's been tested in Indonesia. It's been tested in. Uh, Vietnam uh -huh. against dengue. Right. It's been tested in Australia through this citizen science mozzie box project, and now it's going to be tested in Brazil and Colombia to combat Zika. Okay, we've got a short time. Should, you know, right now there was a big controversy of the Olympics going there. What should happen there now? Should say the Olympics is an enormous worldwide global, oh, backed by NBC, but shh. Um, should it happen? Should it take place as a, as a, as a doctor and a scientist? So, so, What's the danger? First things first, the, the, the danger is that Zika causes a terrible, frightening birth defect. And th there is no doubt now, because the studies have been done, that if you have Zika virus infection while you're pregnant, you have about a 13% chance, the data just came out with lots and lots of studies now, about a 13% chance that your baby will have microcephaly. So the fact that the baby's head is small is an outward sign of 
uh, abnormal brain development, there can be seizures, there's a change in the abil baby's ability to think. This is a very serious, scary birth defect. Mm -hmm. Like when some uh, people used to talk about rubella. Mm -hmm. People were worried about pregnant oh, women and rubella. It's not right. dissimilar to that. It causes neurologic birth defects. So, okay. so this is very scary. So should yeah. that happen? Should we not? So there, there, is, um, there are two things that people need to know about this. Number one is this is a serious problem for pregnant women. For other people, typically Zika doesn't cause uh, big problems. But the other thing we know is that Zika virus is sexually transmitted. So it's not just a scary problem for females who could get pregnant to go to areas where the mosquitoes are. It's also a problem so for if people a, to sexually transmit the if disease. If a male went to the Olympics, yes. came back, had sex, with somebody, uh, with a woman, and she got pregnant, that could... That could transmit Zika. So why are we having the Olympics in a place full of this so, disease and mosquitoes? So I'm not the decision maker for no, the Olympics. But, but, but you were, but I, you're I, the head of a big... But, but I can tell you that there's, there's, on the negative side of the ledger, what you just said is the scary thing. So what can we do to combat, combat Zika? wear long sleeves, avoid mosquitoes, use mosquito repellent. We all know those remedies, none of which are 100%. People are going to the Olympics. They're going to be drunk. It, They're it, going to the, be drunk. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, no, people were worried about I'm spring serious. break for that very reason. For males, if, if males... Oh, break, males will behave themselves better. <laughs> if a man returns from a Zika-infected area, the suggestion is that he use condoms or avoid sex when he returns. Um, that's how serious it is. Now, use now, condoms is, is is a generally good piece of advice. It's a good piece of advice. Not have sex a little harder to. It, it actually expect. is is not well uh, proven. Yeah. Um, it, often when we ask people to be abstinent, they don't follow those directions. Okay. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> that's true. You can quote me on that. Actually, and that is the conclusion of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. No, but the. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Stick Our with me. I'll teach done. you a thing or two. Uh, I will teach before. you a thing or two. Here's the thing that I think is really important, though. It is winter. So August is, is July and August is winter. We're talking about the Southern Hemisphere. So the, it, the, the folks who are thinking about Olympics and trying to think about what the right thing is to do, that is one asset. It's not the peak. The Why, the mosquitoes season. aren't around in the winter? Or mosquitoes decrease uh, in the winter, just right. in, in the so, Southern Hemisphere, like every place right, else. But what do you mean when you say decrease? Mm. A little? A lot? Three I'm, quarters? I, I'm not uh, an expert on the magnitude of the decrease, but I can tell you in the US so far, um, we're worried about the area along the south of the U.S., and we have not seen mosquitoes transmit Zika in the United States. We have seen... Are you expecting uh, that? We, I think one should expect that it could happen, but mosquito control is much, much more effective in the United States than in these areas, for example, in Brazil or Colombia, where there are many poor people with no screens and standing water. All right, last question, because um, we're going to get to questions from the yeah. audience. Um, what is your next horrifying task? <laughs> what do you think the most important, you know, world health issue? Cancer, or is it, it and, and, and related in, in a yeah. way to technology, what do you yeah, think so, is something? So I'll tell you one that I'm really excited about. So uh, 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 alongside of the um, diseases that you would expect that we work on, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, we work on a whole group of, dr of um, diseases called neglected tropical diseases, NTDs, or neglected infectious diseases. There's one that I've always been most scared of. And when I lived in Africa, I always said, I don't want to get African sleeping sickness. So African sleeping sickness is a terrible disease transmitted by the tsetse fly. Mm -hmm. And today, we have effective mosquito traps that are cost effective and can trap the tsetse fly. We have an effective oral drug to treat uh, African sleeping sickness, and we have a really rapid diagnostic, all made with grants and collaborations with private companies. Mm -hmm. So really good news, we could wipe out African sleeping sickness once and for all. How, how long do you think? I actually think it's not a matter of decades. I think it's probably within the next decade it'll be in our sites. Great, questions from Fantastic. the audience? Please, please, questions, because I've got some more questions. No one has a CT fly question? All right, <laughs> I'm gonna ask two more questions to you, uh, Susan. Um, 
when you think about how technology, you're working for one of the most famous technologists in the world. Um, we do have a question right here. Let me finish asking this. Okay. Do you, do you consider yourself technology to help you do this, or is it just a matter of plain old doctoring? And So we um, at the Gates Foundation, and I personally love innovation. Mm -hmm. When we think about um, what we're trying to do, we not only love innovation, but we love the concept of leapfrogging what's really hard in, in poor countries. So two of my favorite innovations that the foundations worked on, one's become famous because of Bill drinking poop water on Jimmy Fallon. Yes, that was nice. So we skipped sewer systems. Most big urban poor oh, cities, terrible. terrible, terrible, right? The, it's open sewage, it's a disaster. So we're trying to leapfrog sewer systems with what's called an omniprocessor that takes right. care of sludge and, tra uh, and translates to water. That's a great innovation. Mm -hmm. The other innovation we're completely taking advantage of is that most of the world has leapfrogged over landlines yeah. and smartphones we've have read that. completely we've read that. changed yeah. the yeah, way. That one we've, we've heard, heard completely that. changed we know about we that. So everything from health to loans to insurance to talking about your soil, your weather if you're a farmer. We're trying to take full advantage of smartphones. Right, okay. Okay, over there. You've read about those smartphones. Yes, I have. Not awesome. the Microsoft ones, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's true. <laughs> hey, they just got out of the business. I didn't do it, so just. So this no, I great. like the Microsoft phone, by the way. Oh, I, I just got her in your trash talking. Oh, I'm teasing. <laughs> Has to. Glad when, you didn't bring it When you're done. Um, this is going back to the uh, mosquitoes. You were talking about the bacterial um, uh, method of control. There's been a lot of interesting research in genetic um, control of mosquitoes, which allow uh, one generation to reproduce and then they die off. Uh, do you have any comments as to the trade-offs between those two choices? Because this is similar. What yeah, you're doing. so the, 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 the approach uh, to vector control that I talked about uh, with Wolbachia is very much tapping into a natural way that bacteria um, prevent transmission of viruses. So we know this has happened in the wild, and this has been worked on since 2005. So it's been tested, and it's been reproduced. So it is much further along than gene editing. So gene editing, particularly using CRISPR, has been, um, uh, is, is further behind scientifically, and the combination of CRISPR and gene drive to, to drive that trait quickly through a population, I would say is not yet ready for prime time. So I'm much more confident that in the here and now for Zika, that Wolbachia is ready enough um, to, to be tested, whereas I think gene drive, particularly because of some of the ecological and ethical consideration, isn't quite there yet. That's a really good point. Thanks. Over here. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm not a mosquito expert, but uh, everything I've read seems to suggest we think at least these types of mosquitoes aren't super critical to like the, the ecosystem. Other species don't depend on them and everything. And we seem to have a couple of really promising ways to basically wipe them out. So why aren't we just wiping them out? So uh, a couple things I think are, are important. The, when I said the, the comment about the ecology, um, there is a global dialogue going on about the, um, the consequences of wiping out a species. Um, the, I would say the unintended consequences of wiping out a species. I'm not particularly fond of Aedes aegypti either. Um, and they're in the areas, for example, in Australia where they've been wiped out, they're thought to, for example, maybe um, uh, be responsible for 10% of transmitting pollen across plants. We could probably do without that 10%, but the unintended consequence is part of the global dialogue. So, so I think that's that? the right thing. Who decides? So, so it, the sovereign nations in the end decide on their own. So the experiments that are going on in Colombia and Brazil are being done in collaboration with the government. Um, global regulators, WHO here, the Food and Drug Administration will decide for uh, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. So it's a regulatory and a social community discussion. The community has what to What do be. you think? Um, I think what I said before is the case. I think on Wolbachia, I think it's proven enough that uh, community dialogue should take place. That's why the citizen science is so powerful. People can talk about it. The kids can learn about it in science class. Gene drive is different, though. Gene drive is so fast and so powerful that you can't depend on one country. So it's going to take a global, more WHO or UN agency-like dialogue, because if the mosquito goes from one country to another, it doesn't matter if Brazil decides. But by the time the neighbors. UN decides to do it, 
it'll be too late, right? I mean, because just by nature, it's very slow. It, the process is very slow, but the dialogue and and I'm this is now happening in in Colombia and in Brazil. No, I don't it mean this. Happen, I mean the other thing. The other thing the I think is I I it it would not surprise me if the eradication isn't ready for this Zika outbreak. Okay, last very quick question. Yeah, I'm curious your thoughts about uh, superbugs and antibiotics. My sister was recently came down with MRSA, so we'd wear lab coats around her. It's a staff that's antibiotic resistant. Yeah. There was a recent headline about E. coli uh, and how it now resists all antibiotics, and it can potentially transfer that trait to other uh, bacteria. Yeah, the the. Um the whole area of antimicrobial resistance, whether it's in E. coli or staph, is a massive global issue on two fronts. Um, one is that it's increasing, as you experienced in your family, and we just heard about a urinary tract infection with an E. coli that resists one of, the, one of our, our true last resorts. Pharma and biotech have not invested in this area. It's a true market failure, and in the case of market failures, others have to step in. Um, in our case, we have invested heavily in antimicrobial resistance in malaria and tuberculosis in particular. We're very concerned, especially with malaria. And in that case, not only the malaria parasite, but the mosquitoes, and in this case, Anopheles mosquitoes, are becoming resistant to our pesticides. So this is a massive global problem. And um, there's a lot of global dialogue about putting in place um, new funding mechanisms so that companies will be incented to do novel uh, antibiotics. Thank Watch you. this space. Okay, well, Susan, thank you, very you much. terrified yeah. me, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.